Hi there, this is Luke. As you may know, up until this point, I have been the only one working on the videos here at Wartime Stories. Everything from the writing of each episode to the voiceover, artwork, and production. Uh, so saying, I feel honored to announce that for both this episode and the next, some of my friends are helping me out. Since most of us work together as reconnaissance marines, I guess I thought it would be appropriate to ask them to be the voices of the recon men in this story. So as far as authenticity goes, I don't know how you can beat that. None of them are voice actors, so be sure to stick around during the credits to listen to the bloopers. Um, guys, I have to say that if I left the Marines with anything of value, it's you. Uh, it was my friends. Uh, we don't talk much these days, but you know, even when I spring something random like this on you last minute, <laughs> you guys still came through. Uh, so, man, God bless you guys. Um, Stay safe out there, and thank you for helping me to bring this incredible story to life. Be advised, light vehicle traffic on that road down there. Hope you know what you're doing. LZ is awful close to Charlie. Approaching LZ, all clear. Greyhound 1, Greyhound 2, go ahead. Greyhound 1, get start complete. Greyhound 2, insert complete. Regroup on me. Good luck, boys. Trying to make it back in time for beer and bedtime stories. All right, that's 30 minutes. Rock up, let's move. Feeling confident that the noise of their insertion into enemy territory hadn't attracted unwanted attention, the Special Forces recon team, wearing North Vietnamese uniforms and carrying stolen enemy weapons to complete their disguises, now headed south along the tree line. Moving in a dispersed column formation, they crept, as quietly as possible, through the dense Cambodian jungle, trying to put distance between themselves and the small jungle clearing. Their objective, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the enemy's main supply route, a well-maintained gravel road only a half mile ahead of them. Once they reached it, their next steps would be entirely improvised. Along with mapping enemy trails and encampments discovered along their route, their primary objective was to hijack a North Vietnamese supply truck right off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. How they would accomplish this seemingly miraculous feat was anyone's guess. Now skirting west along a narrow foot trail, which would soon intersect the gravel road ahead, the two recon men at the front of the patrols suddenly stopped moving, holding up a clenched fist to signal quietly to the line of men behind them to do the same. Through the jungle ambiance, they suddenly heard the sounds of several people cutting through the brush on the trail ahead of them, a working party of enemy soldiers, easily identifiable by their uniforms and AK-47 rifles. The lead recon men, Mousseau and Bao, now crouching in the dense brush only a few feet off the trail, watched with increasing trepidation as the three North Vietnamese soldiers hacked through vines and branches, drawing closer to their concealed position. A dozen yards behind them, having moved further off the trail for concealment, their team leader, Sergeant Wright, hoped that the noise of the machetes and breaking branches would soon recede to the east, indicating the work crew had passed by their 12-man team on the trail. This is part two of the story of Roy Benavides, Six Hours in Hell.
Damn it, Frenchie. What happened? Yeah. They chopped right up to us. We had no choice. We hit the bodies, but the gunfire may have compromised us. In a damn mess. You good? Uh, Whose blood is that? Oh, luckily not mine. Oh, all right, well, we can't keep going this way. Move back to that gully we just passed. We'll take over there. Let's go. Right. You want to call this in? Get Torna on the hook for me. Yeah. We should at least let him know we've taken contact and stand by for a possible extract. On it. So what now? We switch an alternate route or? Quiet. Connor, switch out all. More NBA. Ah. They must have heard the gunfire. Sounds like they're sweeping the LZ. Heading south towards the trail. You said you hid the bodies? Yeah, we did. Good distance off the trail. Well, if they skip past us and we move north, might still have a shot. Connor, see if you can get comms a torn out. He should still be flying over us right now. Bird dog, this is RT Charles. You think they heard the gunfire? Could just be a bigger work party heading down to cut that trail. Huh, maybe. Or we're standing on top of a damn commie base. Tunnels right under our feet for all we know. Bird dog, this is RT Charlie. Come in over. No comms. It's this damn jungle. Canopy's probably too thick in this gully. All right, pack it up. Let's move back to our rally point and try it there. The teams move back to their original rally point, several meters from the tree line, on the northeast side of the same jungle clearing where they'd been inserted. They listened intently to the sounds of the unknown group trying to determine their direction of movement. Sounds like they're still moving away from us, heading towards the road. Bad news though, they ain't here to trim trees. Tuan says the Sigis heard him say helicopter. Said he's pretty sure they're looking for a recon team or a down slip. Connor, you get that radio up yet? Yeah, give me a minute. I'm just swapping out my antenna. What are you thinking, right? Yeah, I want to call this in, but... This might be our only shot to get that damn truck. I see we sent up a sit rep. See if command will still give us a green light. Then we'll try a different route. What do you guys think? Sounds good. Let's do it. I'll work on a new route. Bow. Get your map out. Bird dog, bird dog. This is RT Charlie. Radio check over. RT Charlie, this is Bird dog. I had to leave a Charlie over. Roger that. I read you same. Stand by for sit rep over. Here, Chief. She's all yours. Thanks. Her dog. This is RT-1. Over. Go ahead, RT-1. Start with line five. Quiet. They're coming back. Oh, crap. Say again, RT-1. I do not copy your last. Over. Her dog. This is RT-1. Contact and are back at our insert point. Break. Large enemy search party now crossing the LZ toward our position. Break. We're about to have Charlie up our ass. Request immediate extract. Over. Roger that. I see more vehicles on the road. Looks like the damn Jersey Turnpike. Bravo 1, Bravo 1, this is Bird Dog. Come in over. Send it, Bird Dog. RT 1 has reported enemy contact. Requesting immediate extract. How copy over? Solid copy. We're on our way now. Tell RT-1 to switch to channel 3. Over. Copy that. RT-1, RT-1, this is Bird Dog. Send it. Bravo 1 is inbound. Switch to channel 3. How copy? Copy. Switch it now. Back in the command and control slick, First Lieutenant Fred Jones, the launch officer in charge of the mission, told his pilots, Major Jesse James and First Lieutenant Alan Yerman, to turn the helicopter around and head back toward the jungle clearing to get back in range of the team's radio. Enemy contact, thought Jones. That was quick. 
Unfortunately, they couldn't quit yet. This mission had a significant level of importance to it. The team's primary goal was to capture a North Vietnamese truck. The stolen truck would then be somehow transported back to Loc Ninh. The capture of an enemy truck inside of Cambodia would be used to indisputably prove to the stubbornly skeptical Cambodian leader that the communists were indeed breaking international laws by heavily operating inside of the neutral country. U.S. military advisors believed that such ironclad evidence would serve to expose the communist treachery to the world and provoke the cooperation of Cambodia's Prince Sihanouk in allowing the U.S. to forcibly remove the unwelcome invaders, thus cutting off their essential supply routes. Now flying back towards the recon team's position in the command and control helicopter, Lieutenant Jones found himself wondering about the Special Forces Major, who was also riding along. With his initial assumption being that this senior officer was sent along to only observe the mission, Jones would now realize he had been sent to ensure the mission was completed. RT-1, this is Bravo-1 Juliet. What's your status, over? Not good. We are compromised. Contact with three tangos. All dead. Hit the bodies. Move back to our insert. Charlie is Sergeant LZ. Stand by for extract. No. No. They have to stay in. No. Major, that's not the way we do this. I'm the launch officer. We're gonna go in and get them, come back, and refuel, regroup, and then we'll put them back on their alternate LZ. We have to get them now. Jones instructed the co-pilot, Yerman, to get the other slicks on station back in the air and prepare to extract the recon teams. The Major again cut across him. No, they're not in contact. They're going to stay in. Sir, with all due respect, it's my job to keep those men safe. While the officers on board the CNC slick continued to argue about standard operating procedures and conflicting orders, flying high above the jungle clearing in his O1F bird dog Cessna, Air Force Captain Robin Tornow waited for further instructions with growing concern. Tornow knew this was one of the deepest missions into Cambodia yet. If things went south, he knew this would not be the first team to simply vanish. Previous Special Operations Reconnaissance teams were still MIA, their final radio transmissions being marked by gunfire and static before they went completely silent, never to be heard from again. Among other possible threats in the dense jungle, by late 1967, the NVA had converted an entire brigade, several thousand soldiers, into hunter-killer forces for the express purpose of hunting down American and South Vietnamese recon teams on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. By the war's end, over 50 SOG operators would go missing without explanation, some teams seeming to simply be swallowed by the jungle without a single radio transmission. Tornow was likewise familiar with the Special Forces Code, while on mission, these men wore no forms of identification, no dog tags, wedding rings, nothing. Under no circumstances would they allow themselves to be captured. They would fight to the death, protecting one another. Burdock, this is Bravo One. Tell the team to evade and stay concealed until the threat passes then move on with their mission. What? Um, copy that. <sighs> what the hell are they thinking? RT-1, RT-1, this is... Although surprised at this unusual break of standard protocol, Tornow passed this message on to Sergeant Wright. Copy that bird dog, RT-1 out. You guys heard him, Rucko. We'll take a shortcut to get away from the LZ before Charlie finds us. Except for Tornow maintaining his forward air controller position, circling 4,000 feet overhead, the remaining aircraft had landed back at the B-52 compound at Quan Loi to refuel, monitor their radios, and await further instructions. Meanwhile, the teams moved as quietly as possible through the increasingly dense jungle, now on the north side of the clearing and heading west, scanning their surroundings for potential enemy snipers or the unnaturally straight lines of a hidden bunker. An increasing amount of sunlight breaking through the overhead canopy indicated they were reaching another tree line, this being on the upper section 
of the same kidney-shaped clearing. With no enemies visible, one at a time, they began to cross this narrower section of clearing to its opposite side, again heading towards the Ho Chi Minh Trail. As point man for the patrol, one of the Sijis, Bao, was the first to cross, followed by O'Connor. Suddenly, when Bao was only a third of the way across, eight to twelve NVA soldiers emerged from the jungle on the far side of the clearing. Spotting each other, they all stopped abruptly. With the team being disguised in North Vietnamese uniforms, Bao, being a South Vietnamese man, quickly composed himself, then continued to walk confidently toward the enemy soldiers, speaking loudly in Vietnamese. O'Connor, meanwhile, had casually walked a few steps back to stand next to Mousseau. Pulling a piece of paper from his pocket, the two Caucasian men looked intently down at the paper, pretending to examine it in order to keep their facial features hidden. Their interpreter, Tuan, another South Vietnamese man, approached them from the trees. They ding me from the other unit. Tell them that we're looking for a chopper that was shot at, that we heard go down. Tuan nodded, but before he could move, Bao had turned around and began shouting back at their team with feigned authority. The men immediately understood what he was doing. Acting as if he was their leader, Bao commanded them to go and search the thickest jungle area behind them. Without hesitation, Musso and O'Connor turned and walked back towards the tree line. I think they might have seen your face. When Bao is clear, you take the left and I'll take the right, but only if things look bad. Okay. Behind them, Bao continued to bark orders at them. It seemed to be working. The NVA leader waved to Bao as if to say goodbye. Suddenly, in an instant, Musso, O'Connor, and Bao leapt into action. As planned, Musso raised his AK-47, targeting the enemy soldiers on the right, O'Connor taking those to the left. Still positioned in the middle of the clearing, Bao followed their lead, firing on any left standing. Within seconds, most of the enemy were dead. The remaining two dropped to a kneeling position and returned fire, one of them letting loose a rocket-propelled grenade. The RPG hit the trees over the team's heads and exploded, showering them with debris, while the three men in front continued to lay suppressing fire on the enemy as they backstepped into the tree line. Wright was on the radio. Be advised, this is R2 Bravo. We are taking fire. Request immediate extract. We are in heavy contact. What is your ETA? With all three men now clear of the line of fire, their Siji teammates opened up on the remaining two NDA, killing them. Moving back 20 to 30 yards into the jungle, the team formed a new perimeter around their position, facing outwards. So, slicks are on their way. They're ready for a hot one. Here, destroy these. They're no good to us now. After watching them burn the classified documents with C4, Wright motioned for the teams to head back along their route toward their original insertion point. They needed to get back before the slicks arrived to pick them up hoping they would be long gone before a larger enemy force arrived. Back at Loch Ninh, the men of the 240th Reaction Force were sprinting out to their helicopters and spinning up their rotors. Having accidentally killed their slick's battery by monitoring the radio, the Greyhound 1 crew rushed to replace it. Greyhound 2, 3, and 4, along with their supporting helicopter gunships, Mad Dog 1 and 2, were off the ground within minutes, speeding toward the recon team's position. Extract, standing by, over. Same location as insert. That's correct. Same exact location as insert. Seems awful quiet. Yeah, too quiet. Keep your heads on a swivel. That's all right. Team one, ruck up. You'll have about a 20 to 30 yard sprint as they land. We'll provide cover. Toss some smoke, but it might give us away. Connor, switch to channel three. On it. Two miles out, radio three. Stay on your third heading. T1, 
Team one, get ready to spot. What in the hell? Break it right! Wartime stories will continue right after this. And now, back to the story. Two miles out, Ray on three. Stay on your current heading. Taking ground fire! Although the area surrounding the team remained silent, it sounded as if the entire jungle had started firing at the incoming slicks. The lead aircraft, Mad Dog 1, was peppered with enemy bullets. The door gunner, Swisher, was blown off his M60 and collapsed. His helmet cracked, blood now oozing from a small hole in his forehead. Luckily, he wasn't dead, but the shrapnel had knocked him unconscious. Before he could react, Sergeant First Class Pete Jones suddenly heard the gunship's engine whine and saw black smoke the smell of burning oil filling the air. The pilot banked hard to the west, away from the pickup zone. Only a moment later, Greyhound 3 flew head-on into the wall of gunfire, which likewise tore through the aircraft's thin metal and plastic exterior, the pilots feeling the bullets impacting the underside of their armored seats. Attempting to return fire from their M60s into the jungle below, door gunner Michael Craig suddenly fell back onto the cabin floor, a bullet having narrowly passed up under his ballistic armor had torn through his ribs and chest. As the belly man shouted to the pilot, the second gunner was also knocked back into the cabin by a bullet to the shoulder. As Greyhound 3 veered off from its approach, following the now crippled Mad Dog 1 to the west, Greyhound 4 broke through the ground fire, skimming the treetops over the recon team's left shoulders, its nose flaring up as it dropped down into the clearing. The slick now hovered low, off the ground, flattening the tall grass below its rotor wash. Before Sergeant Wright could use a smoke or mirror signal to alert the pilot of their position, a half dozen NDA emerged from the opposite tree line, waving as they approached Greyhound 4. The aircraft touched down on the grass, preparing to board these six men. A fatal error. They had assumed the group of NDA soldiers was one of the American-led teams in disguise. Realizing this, the Sigi riflemen suddenly opened fire on the enemy soldiers from their concealed position on the far side of the waiting helicopter. Inside Greyhound 4, the door gunner facing the team now began strafing the northern tree line with his M60. He had mistaken the recon team for the enemy. Get that chopper back in the air! Damn, no response. Connor, change to the command channel. I can't get him. Done. Get that chopper back in the air! Get them out of there! That is Charlie! Unable to hear his desperate transmissions, the crew inside Greyhound 4 continued to wait, still unaware six enemies were approaching their aircraft. Mousseau and O'Connor took aim, and finally, the lead NVA soldier dropped dead to the ground. At this, the rest of the NVA raised their AK-47s and charged, opening fire on the helicopter. Now realizing their mistake, the door gunner opened up on the charging enemies, their bodies flying backward as the torrent of gunfire ripped through them. O'Connor flipped through radio channels, holding his antenna overhead, cursing, and praying as he desperately tried to establish radio contact with anyone. Wright tapped him on the shoulder, pointing across the clearing at what was now moving through the far tree line. A column of some 30 NBA soldiers, rapidly nearing the helicopter. With their only other gunship, Mad Dog 2, having followed standard protocol by veering off course to instead follow the mortally wounded Mad Dog 1 to its eventual crash site, Greyhound 4 had no air support. It was now a sitting duck. Feverishly scanning the area for any sign of the recon team, a smoke grenade, a mirror flash, a bright orange panel, the crew members saw nothing. A hundred yards from where the helicopter had landed, Sergeant Wright knew the distance was too far to run. His team would likely be cut down halfway across the clearing. Unable to reach anyone over the radio, Wright ordered Mousseau to fire on the approaching NBA column. A rocket-like projectile, Mousseau's light anti-tank weapon, shot across the open field, while Wright and O'Connor pumped grenade after grenade from their handheld launchers, pummeling the distant tree line with explosions. At this, the NVA suddenly broke loose from the jungle and charged, 
toward the front and right side of Greyhound 4. Another cluster of enemy soldiers then charged from their concealed positions on the left, flanking the helicopter's position. Carrying only a 38 caliber revolver, the co-pilot, Warrant Officer James Fussell, could only watch as the enemy approached, spraying the aircraft with a hail of bullets. A sudden movement caught his eye. Looking down, he was surprised to see an enemy soldier underneath the cockpit, attempting to aim his AK-47 up at him, the long rifle fortunately being difficult to maneuver in the short space between the ground and the helicopter. Taking aim with his pistol, Fussell fired three shots through the plexiglass nose bubble while yelling through the deafening sounds of gunfire into his mic. Let's go, let's go, let's go. The pilot, Warrant Officer William Armstrong, pulled pitch, lifting the now mutilated helicopter off the ground. Fussell looked back into the cabin, seeing his gunner, Specialist Gary Land, firing his mounted M60 into what seemed like dozens of green-clad soldiers rushing the helicopter, bayonets fixed on their rifles. As he turned back to face the cockpit, the buzzing of the M60s suddenly stopped. Straining against his harness to look back again over his left shoulder, he saw that Land was now laying sprawl behind his gun, a stump of raw meat replacing what used to be his foot, a severed artery gushing blood onto the cabin floor. Looking over his right, Fussell saw his other gun, Specialist Robert Wessel, pulling himself back onto his M60, his cheek and neck now ripped open, his jaw hanging loose and dripping blood. In the center of the cabin, James Calvi, the Special Forces medic who was the aircraft's belly man, continued firing his carbine, dropping two NBA soldiers who were only a few feet from reaching the door. Pulling his mangled legs back into the cabin, Land again manned his door gun, giving Calvi time to apply a compression bandage and tourniquet to his leg and stop the bleeding. Calvi then moved to Wessel to tend his neck wound. Wessel pushed him away and kept firing. As Calvi resorted to firing his M4, alternating between left and right doors, a bullet struck his elbow, traveling up the inside of his arm before exiting through his shoulder. Despite his wound, he kept firing on the relentless NBA assault. Back in the cockpit, Fussell had only a moment's notice before raising his pistol to again fire through the glass, and NBA was attempting to bayonet him through his side window. Looking to his right at the aircraft commander, he saw him suddenly lurch forward, then quickly sit back upright, blood now pouring down from under his flight helmet. Fussell instinctively grabbed his co-pilot controls, but Armstrong, apparently unaware that he'd just been shot in the back of the head, shouted at him and pulled back on his controls. I got it! The aircraft felt heavy as it struggled to rise, the engine whining as the rotors picked up speed. 25 feet, 50 feet. Now 75 feet off the ground, the ground fire increased in intensity. Unable to wait any longer to clear the highest treetops ahead of them, Armstrong pushed the stick forward. Branches disintegrated as the rotor blades cut a path through them, the pilots silently hoping they didn't make contact with a hardwood branch that would drop the aircraft out of the sky. Still skimming the treetops, Fussell received a shock as he suddenly made eye contact with an equally startled NBA soldier, frozen with fear, sitting 100 feet off the ground in a sniper's nest mounted with a heavy caliber machine gun. Finally, missing the enemy soldier, Greyhound 4 broke through the jungle canopy. As Armstrong lost focus with the increasing blood loss from his head wound, Fussell took the controls and directed the crippled aircraft east, back towards the B-52 compound at Loch Ninh. Unfortunately, not realizing that their compass was now damaged, instead of flying east, they were now heading due west, deeper into Cambodia. As the wounded Greyhound 4 was lifting off, drawing the enemy's attention and gunfire, the recon teams had retreated a few yards deeper into the jungle. Finally making radio contact with Tornow, who was still circling overhead in a Cessna, Wright got even more bad news. The Sidges were right about the heavy vehicle movement they heard. The big shit is coming, but we still have time before they get here. Another extraction team is coming in with gunships. Hoping to avoid the same confusion during the second extraction attempt, the men knew they had to put themselves out in the open where the incoming extraction team could easily identify them. However, they still needed some cover from the incoming enemy as well. In the middle of the clearing was a waist-high anthill, as well as a couple large thickets. The 20 yards of space between the thickets offered a reasonable pickup zone. The team agreed that the central location would also allow the door gunners a good position to suppress the enemy fire, combined with the aerial fire and rockets from the gunships. The problem was getting to the middle of the clearing. All right, team one, go, 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 go. Mousseau and five Sigi, including Bao, sprinted across first, closing the 30-yard distance without incident and immediately setting up a defensive perimeter. Wright and O'Connor, along with the remaining four Sigi, were not as fortunate. 
As they approached the center of the clearing, running hunched over in the waist-high grass, without warning, gunfire erupted once again from the distant tree line. One or more bullets slammed into Wright, stopping him mid-stride. He stumbled, spun around, and collided with O'Connor. O'Connor had taken a bullet to his left wrist. Both men toppled over. Two Siji behind them took multiple hits, instantly crumpling into the grass, their lifeless bodies continuing to twitch, but they were hit with repeated fire from an elevated enemy position in the trees beyond the anthill. We gotta move. Let's go. Get to the hill. Their wounds not yet fatal, Wright and O'Connor scrambled to their feet to reach the anthill, which would conceal them from the incoming fire. After only a few short steps, Wright's body jerked violently as he was hit again. Right! Right! Where you hit? I don't, I don't know. I can't move my legs. I can't feel them. As he watched shock setting in on right and felt the burning pain in his now useless left arm, O'Connor knew their only chance of surviving was to get to the anthill. Leroy, are your arms working? Can you still hold your AK? Yeah. Roll me over. Help me up. You gotta stay down. Hold on. We'll get you going. Come on. Get over here. Right. Take Juan's AK. We're gonna pick you up and move. But you gotta hold our weapons. Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Go. 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 Through a hail of relentless enemy fire which zipped through the grass and slapped the ground around them, Tuan and O'Connor half-carried, half-dragged right the remaining distance to the anthill. Taking defensive positions, the men began returning fire, watching as squads of NBA rushed from the jungle into the clearing, dropping low and disappearing into the grass, creeping toward their position as the team then fired blindly into it. Now waiting for help to arrive, Wright continued to make failed attempts to reach Fact Tornow with a CNC slick. I can't get through. It's all garbled. I don't think it's English. They're jamming us. Can the NBA do that? Damn it. No. The mic is hot. Everyone's trying to talk at the same time. Just keep listening and see if you can jump in when it's breaking the transmission. The enemy fire suddenly increased. The team pressed themselves close to the ground. As Mousseau shouted, a group of at least eight NBA broke free from the tree line towards his position. O'Connor, Wright, and Tuan shifted their AK fire and lobbed M79 grenades towards them, when suddenly... Their air support had arrived. Wright finally made contact with a gunship, passing up a sit rep and directing their fire toward the enemy positions in the tree line. Mad Dog 3 and 4 now roared over their heads, their fast, low-level passes and superior firepower dropping many of the NBA who were exposed in the open clearing. However, from Fact Tornow's viewpoint overhead, he could see increasing waves of NBA troops converging on the clearing, with more enemy vehicles continuing to arrive on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, only a short distance to the west. This was no small-sized patrol, Tornow realized. This was an entire enemy base camp. He quickly assessed the situation below him. Several helicopters out of commission, two men dead on the ground, three severely wounded, leaving only seven men against hundreds of enemies inside of Cambodia, where artillery and fixed-wing aircraft support were by no means authorized. In fact, none of this was authorized. To save these men's lives, he had to do something drastic. In what he would later call an impulsive reaction, Captain Tornow proceeded to jeopardize his career by blatantly breaking the rules of engagement. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Any fighters in the area? I need anything I can get. Vector 10 miles southwest of Loch Ninh. I need to put you in immediately. Troops in heavy contact. This is a Daniel Boone tactical emergency. I say again, this is a Daniel Boone tactical emergency.
wife puts the kids to bed. I sit down to record. Upstairs neighbor takes a shower. Every single time. Okay, this next one. Uh, I'm hit! And did you adjust your levels before you sent this to me? Man, uh, I'm very impressed. But anyway, perfect. Um, I mean, l listen to how this sounds. Oh, I'm hit! Get your 15, yeah! Take off your pants on the floor! He's our best shot is what he is. <laughs> Back at Loch Ninn, the men of the 204th reaction. Back at Loch Ninn. Can you not just make plastic noises? Uh. Hey Luke, extremely happy I could help you here. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a, a brief taste of uh, real voice acting here as I slip into the role of O'Connor in that very first recon patrol. Right? You want to call this in? All right, Sean, I can't work with you. I'm kidding. Uh, well, that's legitimately disappointing. Uh, everything we just did wasn't recorded? Yeah. Great. God, I'm an idiot. This is a very uh, typical me moment, though. Genuine stealing a Humvee level of garbage. <laughs> that's right. Oh, I, I still can't believe you guys drove that Humvee to the other side of the island. Uh, while I'm sitting at the fuel depot waiting for you to show up, screaming into the radio, trying to figure out where you went. Yeah, I mean, that's what happens when you put two ADHD Marines in a truck together and one of them didn't meet the, make the meeting. <laughs> Let's be real. All right, then they move positions. Uh, then they're going to change plans. O'Connor says, let's do it. And so go ahead and give that line a shot. Uh, just keep in mind that they are whispering uh, because the enemy is really close to their position. Let's do it. Okay, no. Uh, he's not propositioning him for a sexual encounter. He is asking him if they want to change plans. Try it again, but uh, less sexy. Let's do this! You're fired. <laughs> You're a dick. Okay, line one. Come on, you like you? <laughs> Wait, that was the test. <laughs> You're not supposed to. Uh, don't laugh. Don't laugh at the end of it. <laughs> Bow, get out your map. Get it out. We need an alternate route. Alternate route. Can I just say we need another route? This guy says alternate a lot. So the enemy doesn't recognize them right away. And so they're he's whispering, uh, you know, they think we're they from think the... They think we're from the other side. Unit. Okay. <laughs> That's cheap. I mean, the <laughs> thing. So he's whispering, and oh, I see. I see. And like it's like it like this. They think we're from the other unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like he's whispering. It's this damn jungle. No, try that again. <clears throat> it's this damn jungle. No, it's this mother jungle. I think they might have seen your face. I've grown accustomed to your face. I know you watch The Simpsons. Bird dog, bird dog. This is RT Charlie. Radio check over. That's not badass. Yeah. 